Good evening. I'm Joe Holder, pastor of Little Zion Primitive Baptist Church in Bellflower, California. Welcome to our Wednesday evening virtual service. We appreciate your interest in joining with us and ask you to pray for the Lord's guidance and blessing. If you want to follow along and study with us in your Bible, turn to the Gospel of John chapter 21. We'll be looking at the first 17 verses tonight. Let's begin with a good hymn while people are signing in and getting settled. been told that that tune with different words was a tune that was a favorite of the pilgrims who came over on the Mayflower. It certainly carries a lot of history behind it regardless. In your ongoing prayers, I would ask you to be prayerful again for uh, people affected by the fires in, especially right now in Southern California the uh, mountains along the uh, the rim of, of uh, Orange County, uh, just west of us, about 30 miles more or less, uh, are have been burning for the last few days. A lot of homes have been evacuated. A lot of people are affected by the smoke. It's not close to us in terms of imminent danger or problems for us. It's just that a lot of other people are being affected and, and a lot of homes are being threatened. So please keep them in your prayers. We had uh, about two days, a little over a day, of high, dry, they call them here Santa Ana winds, winds that blow in at a very high velocity from the desert into the Los Angeles basin the first of this week. The natural terrain that covers the mountains here was already extremely dry, and after that, it's it's a powder keg. So we're concerned here, who live here, for just any little spark can set off a devastating fire. Pray for us. Pray for safety. We're also hearing that the, the new infections from the virus are going up. Be prayerful for that, too to be brought under control and for the Lord's blessings on and presence to sustain those who are affected by it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight, for the blessing we have that despite all the disruption and the lonely isolation of the last several months, we can gather each time we, we meet in this way we can have a sense of fellowship with each other as we join together in fellowship with you. We thank you that we have such an opportunity and can in this way turn our minds from all of the discouraging circumstances in our world and focus on you and better things. Bless our time together. Bless those who are affected by the fire. Bless those affected by the virus, now or in the future. Keep us 
close to you in your love and your tenderness so that we will be tender toward each other as you are toward us in Jesus name. Amen. We tend in our Bible studies and discussions to spend a lot of time highlighting and emphasizing Peter's flaws. <laughs> he makes himself an easy target. At times he seems crude. He regularly in the record of the Gospels puts his foot in his mouth and yet the Lord called him to be one of his twelve and inspired him to write two New Testament letters. He's also believed to have been quite influential in the life and in the writings of Mark, who wrote one of the Gospels. We should probably exercise a great deal more caution than we do. The more we focus our minds on other people and their failures, Bible people or people in our lives, the more we evade looking at our own sins. You can't correct your own sins when you refuse to acknowledge or confront them. We manifest spiritual maturity not when we ignore and deny our sins or look at other people's sins, but when we look within. When Jesus told the disciples that one of them would betray him, not a one of them said, you know, I never trusted Judas. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he's in a conspiracy with those temple leaders. It, it just, it, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Not a one of them did that. All of them said, Lord, is it I? Focus on others and and highlighting and looking for and emphasizing their flaws always leads to a very unhealthy response in us to life and to our own trials. In today's politics, you hear and you see manifested so, so sadly often, if you do not agree with me on my political leanings, you're my enemy. Or in COVID-19, there's always the, the suspicion of a conspiracy. They did it to us. Or you can, you can occasionally find someone who takes it to the nth degree and, and turns it all into a religious thing and says, God did it to us. COVID-19 does not match the Lord's biblical pattern of judgment against his people for their sins. In scripture, the Lord always warns and calls his people to repentance before sending judgment. Prior to March 1st, in our own culture, the dominant attitude within the Christian community, our own culture included, was more complacency than, than a, a sense of impending judgment. There, there were not a lot of people warning the Lord's people and calling for repentance. Life happens. Bad things happen to good people. Apart from sin, apart from unbelief in their lives. The first chapter of James actually deals with this issue. In recent sermons, Elder John Wallace Thrower has dealt very soundly and instructively on that point. However, whatever happens and from whatever source, difficulties and trials uh, invade our lives, the Lord is always at the ready to help us to deliver his people when calamity disrupts their lives. Rather than pointing fingers elsewhere, we need to focus our minds and our spiritual energy on our own lives and pray for the Lord's grace and forgiveness of our neglects and failures. A healthy Bible attitude appears in a particular verse that interestingly I have heard quoted in sermons more often in the last seven or eight months than I had heard probably in the last five years. 
It's an Old Testament lesson in Second Chronicles 7.14. Solomon is dedicating the temple after its completion and construction, and this is God speaking in answer to Solomon. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Not a word in God's instructive reminder of charging or accusing or examining other people and their failures. We have a lot to learn from Solomon, and in tonight's lesson, a lot to learn from Peter. John begins, the, the, and this is one of my favorite lessons and sections in the entire Gospel of John. He begins the chapter with a beautiful, simple lesson of good food and encouraging words from Jesus. The first couple of verses. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. The Sea of Tiberias is another name that was given to the Sea of Galilee as the Roman influence began to take its hold in the region as they controlled it governmentally. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Jesus had earlier told the eleven that after his death and resurrection, he would go ahead of and meet the disciples in Galilee. You find a record of this in Matthew 26, 32, and Mark 16, verse 7. On this occasion, seven of the eleven disciples were present. As John appears later in the dialogue, one of the two others, obviously, was John. Verse 3. <clears throat> Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a-fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth, and entering into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. These were professional fishermen. This was not a recreational evening. It was a night of professional work and effort. I go a-fishing. Jesus sent the disciples to Galilee to meet him, not fish. We don't know, pardon me, <clears throat> we don't know Peter's motives in this decision. Time has lapsed. We don't see Jesus. Maybe this was all a bad dream or a good dream that went bad. Uh, back to the old career. Financial necessity. Idleness. Nothing better to do. We don't know. We should probably not impute motives. But take heed, my friends. People are always watching us, even when we think they are not. And we set examples, whether we intend to be an example or not. They watch, and if they respect us, they will imitate us. As soon as Peter makes the comment, they all agree, John included, we'll go too. If Peter does the wrong thing, instead of waiting for Jesus, go fishing, then they all are influenced in the wrong direction by his example. Do we lead by good example in our circle of friends and family and, and in our career associates? Or do we follow others in their bad example? Do we, in our conduct, demonstrate by what we do career as more important than church, as TV as more important than Bible reading and study? Notice I say over or more important than. It's honoring to God to be successful in a career. 
It's not honoring to God to choke out your faith because of your career. Television can be, in a very healthy way, informative and entertaining. It can also be quite opposite. So there's nothing in Scripture that says either career or television are a terrible sin. The big issue here is priorities. What is most important in our lives? What, what, where do we put our focus? And by doing that, what kind of example do we set to others? COVID-19 has a tendency to push us to worry over faith in Jesus who stands by us through all of the tensions and stresses of the virus. Political wars of words, and Lord knows we've heard plenty of that in the last few months, the whole time really from the beginning. That tends to stifle our the peace of Jesus that passes understanding that we need far more than, than any kind of political rhetoric. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 13, 11, that we should live in peace, and if we live in peace, that's a conscious, deliberate choice we make, the God of peace shall be with us. In Philippians 4, verse 7, Paul writes some of the richest instructions to be found in the entire New Testament. He begins it with, be careful for nothing, worry about nothing, do not allow one of the greatest adversaries on the battlefield of your faith to invade your life and stifle your faith. That be careful for nothing was followed by instead of worrying about things, take what you, your problems are and your worries and concerns to the Lord. Replace worry with prayer, prayer that always includes thanksgiving. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's verse 7 in Philippians 4. What has been our practice, our daily habit and lifestyle since the 1st of March? Have we been careful for nothing? Worried about nothing? I suspect most of us, and I confess to be in the number, have allowed at times at least worry, concern, and fear to, to have too much influence in our lives. We can't change the past. We can take courage from Jesus and the words of Scripture and memorize these verses, Philippians 4, 7, uh, 6, and 7, and try every morning when you wake up recite these verses to you, say a thanksgiving prayer to the Lord. If there's something on your mind that's creating anxiety, give it to him and ask him to help you control your thoughts about it and help him or ask him to help you honor him and not surrender to our adversary worry as we go forward to the end. Verse 4 uh, well, I'll read verse 4 through 6. But when the morning was come, was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were now not able to draw it, for the multitude of fishes. These were professional fishermen. They hadn't caught a fish all night long. Jesus says, put your net there, and they, they capture so many fish they can't even pull the net into the ship. Given their mixed, very inconsistent reaction to news of Jesus' resurrection, especially in their behavior in Jerusalem, and perhaps even in their going fishing instead of waiting for him here in Galilee. How could Jesus have reacted to them 
in Mark 16, verse 14, he upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart. They might have well expected another upbraiding, but not this time. He does rebuke his disciples, us, when we need it, but he doesn't keep harping and repeating and lingering on the rebuke. He turns from rebuke to encouragement. He gives us every opportunity and every, every help we need to turn from unbelief and hardness of heart to repentance and obedience and faith. Here, instead of rebuking again, it's children. Do you have any food? Did you catch anything last night? And when he calls them to come ashore, they bring the fish with them, but he has not waited to cook their fish. He has fish already cooked and waiting for them on the fire. Jesus in Scripture for his people, I said it in the beginning, I repeat it, always warns and calls his people to repentance before sending his judgment. Prior to Jesus calling them, most of the disciples were commercial fishermen. Going back to even one night of fishing was in fact returning to their career. How did they approach, what attitude did they have toward their career? What attitude have we had over the years toward our careers? Do we consult with Jesus in our choice of a career? When I first began my business uh, employment career, I worked for a very good company and they were very good to me and helped me grow in so many ways in, in my career and prepare for my future. But if you wanted to go forward and advance in this company, you had to be willing to pack up your family and move across the country to one of their locations at a moment's notice. I eventually left that company because I did not choose to put my family through that, nor to sacrifice my faith for that pattern of career. When we are dealing in our career and we face problems and difficulties in our career, do we take those career issues to Jesus in our prayers? Folks, it doesn't matter how technical our career is. He knows more about it. He knows more about the people we deal with in our career than we ever will know. If we take our problems to him, even career problems, and listen for his guidance, our careers will be better served. Verse 7, and I'll read verse 7 and 8. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, John, saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. It, just by his cast your net, and do you have any food? They didn't immediately recognize him, much like Mary Magdalene thinking he was the gardener instead of the resurrected Jesus. There's something different about his resurrected body that is never described, so we, we don't know, but it was there was something different. It is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he didn't argue, he agreed. He girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, probably because he was working in the water during the night fishing, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land, but it was, but as it were, two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. A cubit is about 18 inches, so 200 cubits would be roughly 300 feet, about the length of a football field from the shore. Verses 9 through 12. As soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty and three. 
And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? There's a unique expression here, coals of fire. This term is used only one other time in the New Testament, and it's so relevant to this event and moment here. The last time Peter and Jesus were together was when Peter warmed himself by coals of fire in the courtyard the night he denied Jesus three times. Oh, this would probably bring back so many memories. Come and dine, and, and yet John says, not a one of them said anything or asked him. They just knew it was Jesus. Do we ever receive rich and necessary, important blessings from the Lord, and like these disciples, say nothing? We don't stop to thank him for the blessing he sent? Verses 13 and 14. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them, and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. On several occasions he appeared to individuals or the women or smaller groups. The first time he appeared to the disciples, it would have been his appearance to the ten the evening of his resurrection, Thomas was absent. The second time, roughly a week later, to the eleven, Thomas is now present. This is the third time he appears to a, a significant number of the eleven at one time. From this point, the, they've had dinner, they've had some time to digest not only the food, but the fact that they are in Jesus' presence. presence. Jesus focuses his conversation specifically on Peter. Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus will ask Peter a set of questions three times. It's almost impossible not to associate one with the other. Verse 15, So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. There are several unique words and, and, and changes of words in the, the Greek language and, and somewhat in the English in, in this context, in this conversation. The, the word love is translated from two different Greek words, and the interplay is indeed interesting. But there are also different words for feed and different words in terms of lambs versus sheep. Regardless of the details, and we'll look at the, that detail, Jesus presents Peter with a, 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 a question or a series of questions of increasing intensity. And Peter finally, after the third question, reacts. One thing, please, we, we get on Peter's case, we, we pick him apart, we criticize him. One thing to his credit, in each answer, he responds, thou knowest that I love thee. Whatever Peter's flaws, whatever his difficulties, he had this right. He understood that Jesus knew how much he loved Jesus. In the play of words, young lambs are to be guarded while grazing. They're much more helpless than, than adult sheep. They're to be protected when they're in the pasture grazing and vulnerable. Older sheep are to be shepherded, a different word from the protection. And, and yes, the shepherd protects sheep and lambs alike. But in the 
the, interestingly, the word shepherd for the sheep, feed my sheep, includes walking before the sheep. An example. There are two criteria, two prerequisites that are without compromise in this lesson Jesus gives to us and to Peter. Number one is that you must demonstrate if if you want if you have any notion of of ministering to the lord's sheep from the pulpit or from your home in personal service and care it is prerequisite that you demonstrate your love for jesus the second is walking before that you by your conduct walk before them as a good example. Lovest thou me more than these? The, 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 the question in, in both the original language and in English is admittedly a bit vague. More than these what or whom? There are three leading interpretations or options that you'll find in commentaries and I'll, I'll try to give you some pros and cons uh, to each of these options or interpretations. Number one, do you, Peter, love me more than these men love me? Peter, only a few days ago, just a few days ago, you professed in my presence and theirs that you loved me more than they loved me. They might deny you, but I would die with you before denying you. You profess that, but Peter, you denied me. Can you, in light of your current and recent conduct, honestly say you love me more than these men love me? It's interesting, each of the four Gospels is, is unique, even though it does report many of the same events. In this case, all four Gospels report Peter's profession of, of undying faith. Matthew reports it in chapter 26, verse 35. Mark in chapter 14, verse 31. Luke in chapter 22, verses 31 to 34, and John in chapter 13, verses 37 to 38. There's a, another interesting point. When Jesus, when Jesus told the disciples that he would be crucified, Peter reacted. He did not want a crucified Jesus. Peter? <laughs> oh, Peter. You didn't want to crucify Jesus. How do you feel about me now that I have been crucified? Probing, probing question. You want a Jesus that you wish me to be or the Jesus that I am? The second explanation or interpretation of the more than these option do you love me more than you love these men? Peter, when the pressure was on, you forsook me. You denied me, but you have remained faithful to these men. Do you perhaps love them more than you love me? In contemporary Christianity, I don't know how long the, the cliche has existed or where it originated, but you'll often hear people just throw out the, the cliche in, in contemporary Christianity, blood is thicker than water. The meaning is essentially that family relationships, even in church, are stronger than our faith relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And often that is the case. My question to us tonight, is that how it should be, given all that we have learned from John in this study? Who is the most important person in our life? 
family or Jesus? And the third option to the more than these, do you love me more than ships and nets and commercial fishing your career? Peter, which path do you choose for your future? You very easily went fishing last night. You want to be a fisherman or a follower and a preacher for Jesus? In the contemporary application to us, quite often young people are faced with the dilemma, do I take this golden opportunity, this this dream of a lifetime career position, but it requires me to move to a part of the country where no church of my fellowship is is located within any kind of driving distance. I have to essentially give up my faith and my church or give up the opportunity. Which choice do I make? Where you choose to live. <laughs> I, I'm a living example of the irony of, of that question. No one who was planning or thinking from a, a a natural perspective would think that a young man who grew up on a small farm in agricultural northeast Mississippi would end up for his lifetime essentially, his adult lifetime, pastoring a church in a suburb of Los Angeles, California. What a mismatch! And yet, here I am and here I've been. Do you choose where the Lord wants you to minister? or where you want to live. How much time do you spend on various activities in each day of your life? There's a necessity for a certain amount of time in your career, and we all have, of one kind or another, an entertaining hobby and our faith. If you looked at your calendar, if you looked with a stopwatch at how much time you put into each of those activities each day, where would your faith end up most of the time? This is instructive. It was in Peter's face. It can get in ours as well, can't it? So, which of these three options is the correct one? I I have a leaning toward option number one. Do you love me more than these men love me? At one time, I was rather dogmatic about my belief that that was the right answer and the right option. My answer today, although I lean toward number one, is all three are correct. All three have instructive truth to remind us of our faith and to instruct us richly. Verse 16, he saith, again to the, he saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Here there's no comparison. It's not, Do you love me more than? It's simply, Do you love me? How has your recent conduct weighed on your answer? Peter. And let's look in the mirror, my friends. In the last seven or eight months, how has our personal conduct spoken to our love for Jesus? How would we answer Jesus' question if he asked us these same questions? In, in the greater reflection of Scripture's teaching, Jesus twice in Matthew chapter 25, verse 40 and verse 45, reminds people in judgment, if you did it to them, you did it to me. So with the safety of a, of a computer screen and a keyboard to communicate, instead of being face to face, how many times in the last six to eight months have we hammered away on the keyboard with a little bit of edgy anger and, and sharpness in the words we choose toward people when we disagreed with them? You did it to them. You did it to me. That's convicting. 
and it should motivate us to soften our touch on the keyboard. And if someone writes something that pushes our button and, and we feel a little angry, just stay away from the keyboard until the emotions calm down and you can respond in kindness instead of edginess. Peter answers, thou knowest that I love thee. It's a repetition of sorts, and it's also not quite an exact repetition. Whatever Peter lacks, he does understand Jesus knows my heart. When we choose offense over kindness, criticism over compassion, imputing bad motives to others and their actions over respectful compassion toward them, do we manifest a conviction that Jesus knows and we're willing to trust him and serve him? That we love him by loving fellow believers? That's the rule of Jesus. And finally, in this sequence, verse 17, he saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto them, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. It is so difficult to separate this instance or this incident from Peter's denial. Three times he denied Jesus. Three times Jesus gets in his face in a kind but focused and direct way and puts the question to Peter. Repetition creates emphasis. Jesus is emphasizing something here incredibly. What lessons can we learn from Jesus, lessons that he perhaps taught Peter from this, this, this that study tonight. Number one, it doesn't matter, pastor or believer in the pew, our only valid and biblical basis for interacting with and attempting to help other believers is measured and defined by our love to Jesus. If you're not motivated by your love to Jesus to say or do something, please just don't say it or do it. Number two, our first charge from Jesus is to examine self, not point the finger of blame at others. Look in the mirror. Look in the gospel mirror. James called it the perfect law of liberty not the perfect law of vengeance, not the perfect law of legalism, the perfect law of liberty. That's the gospel, my friends. And James, after telling his readers to be doers and not hearers only of the word that was preached to them, reaches this conclusion, James 1.25, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. It's not an occasional action, it's a habit. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. The context of a doer and not a hearer only is the perfect law of liberty. The gospel James likens to a mirror. We look into this mirror. Who do we see? Do we see Peter and his flaws? Do we see that person at church who sometimes can say or act in ways that just push our buttons and irritate us? Or do we see the only other person in the room? Ourselves. That, my friends, is the powerful lesson James intended, and it's the lesson Jesus takes into Peter's heart with this conversation this night. If we look into the mirror, what do we see? Other people's flaws? No, nope. we see our own. The acid test. When another believer 
a believer who loves us, who cares, and has demonstrated his love or her love over the years, confronts us about our our possible failures and spiritual weaknesses, how do we react? Denial. No, you're wrong. You're mistaken. Anxious dismissal. Oh, no, that's you're, you misunderstand. Or are we willing to give them as we should be willing to give Jesus an honest confession? Yep, that's me. Thank you for calling it to my attention. God willing, I'll work harder to try to improve. If Jesus sat with us in a conversation after a good meal, and if he asked us the same questions he asked Peter, how would we react? And if he told us to feed his sheep and his lambs, what shall we do to fulfill his instructions. That, my friends, is the lesson of the day. Often people preach about the resurrection of Jesus with no sense or connection with how we should live. Oh, scripture does not do that. Always, <clears throat> it connects the reality of our faith in Jesus and his resurrection with how we should take courage, even in the face of discouragement, strength in the face of daunting adversaries, trust and believe in Jesus and his resurrection and prove that belief by honoring him, feeding his lambs and his sheep, serving others and not ourselves. Thank you for joining with me this evening in our study. I hope it's been a blessing to you. Lord willing, we'll meet again on Sunday morning. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for tonight and for sobering, tender, and instructive study of your word that shows us so much about how we should live and honor you in our daily lives. Convict us, enlighten us, burden us, and if necessary, chasten us, but always in love to show us a better way to live and to serve you by serving your people around us that you have put in our lives. And in that way, Lord, help us to honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with me. I appreciate your interest and your presence. Lord willing, we'll see you on Sunday.